Hello everyone, so today we'll be looking at factors affecting eyewitness testimony, misleading information. As always, I'll be following along with the AQA Psychology textbook for A-Level Year 1 and AS with the green haired girl on. So the things you need to know and be able to recognise, I've included your AQA specification point, which is factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, misleading information, including leading questions and post event discussion. So if you have a question that comes up and the phrasing somewhere in that question says factors affecting eyewitness testimony, that relates to the misleading information spread, which is what we're looking at now, and also anxiety. Unless the question specifically asks for misleading information or anxiety. So what is eyewitness testimony? Now, eyewitness testimony is an account of an event from an individual's memory. So eyewitnesses are individuals who give evidence in court concerning the identity of someone who has committed a crime. So leading questions, we're going to take a look at the research by Loftus and Palmer here from 1974. So what they wanted to do was investigate the accuracy of memory after witnessing an event to see if leading questions would affect the accuracy of immediate recall. So they used 45 participants and there was five groups of nine in each and they were shown seven clips of a car accident. Now, after each clip, the participants were given questionnaires and on the questionnaires, there was this one question, which was known as the critical question. So that was how fast were the cars going when they something each other? And there were five different verbs that could go in that something gap. So one of them was hit, which is in there currently. And there was also smashed, collided, bumped and contacted. Now, smashed and contacted, they're the most different from each other. And so the mean estimated speed for smashed was 40.8 miles per hour. You can put 41 miles per hour in the exam round it up. And the mean estimate for speed for contacted was 31.8 miles per hour. You can put 32. So you can see that there is a difference depending on what verb was used. So there is a relationship between the verb used and the estimate of speed. So therefore leading questions bias the eyewitnesses recall of the event. So this is something that is not mentioned in your textbook, but the textbook refers to broken glass, but doesn't actually explain anything further than that further down in the information. So here I've included Lofter and Palmer's part two, where it does talk about broken glass. So this can actually be turned into an evaluation point. It is research support. So their second part to the study, they used 150 students who saw a video of a car crash. So these are different participants to that part one, their original study. So there was 50 students that got the critical question with the verb smashed. And there was 50 students who got the critical question with the verb hit. And there was also 50 students that got no critical question at all. They just got a control question. And now, so after they'd watched the video, a week later, the students were then questioned about the event and they were asked another question of, did you see the broken glass? And in fact, there wasn't any broken glass at all in the video. But when they asked that question, the students who had heard the verb smashed were more likely to say, yes, they did see broken glass because of something called schema. So that's your little packages of information. That's like a mental thing. It, where you store what you would expect to see. So 16 out of 50 said yes to the broken glass in that particular condition where they heard the verb smashed. So why do leading questions affect eyewitness testimony? Now we have two different explanations here. So we have the response bias explanation and the substitution explanation. Now, the response bias explanation is a tendency for interviewees to respond in the same way to all questions, regardless of context. So that's the person being interviewed. So this would bias their answers. For example, when participants get the word smashed, it encourages them to choose a higher speed estimate. So they're responding in a way that is the same to all questions, regardless of the context. 
And now your substitution explanation is an explanation for inaccurate eyewitness recall, suggesting that misleading information replaces the original memory. So for example, the participants that heard smashed were more likely to later then say there was broken glass, even though there wasn't any at all, than those who heard hit, because that critical verb altered their memory of the incident. Your substitution explanation is about your memory being changed because of the misleading information replaces the original memory. We've now got post-event discussion, so we'll look at the research that you've got in your textbook by Gavit and colleagues. But post-event discussion, first of all, what is it? You could be asked the definition of it in the exam, so you need to know what that is. So this occurs where there is more than one witness to an event. So witnesses may discuss what they have seen with co-witnesses, so other people that are at the scene as well. And this may influence the accuracy of each witness's recall of the event. So we've got research to support this. So Gabbert and colleagues, 2003, studied participants in pairs. So there was a pair of people. And what they did was watch a video of the exact same crime, but from different angles. So each participant could see elements in the event that the other one couldn't. So only one participant out of the two that were watching the video clip could see the title of a book being carried by a young woman. But then afterwards, both participants discussed with each other what they had seen before individually completing a test of recall. So the findings were that 71% of the participants mistakenly recalled aspects of the event that they did not see in the video, but had picked up in that afterwards discussion with the other participant. And the corresponding figure in a control group, so those that didn't discuss after they'd seen the clip, was 0%. So what we can say is that witnesses go along with each other, and this is either for social approval or because they believe that other witnesses are right and they are wrong. So that's a concept called memory conformity. So we'll now have a look at the evaluation. We have a strength here. So this is useful real life applications. Now we can say with the leading questions, we do have this real life application because we can apply it to settings that will benefit in society. So if we look here, Loftus believes that leading questions can have a distorting effect on memory. So what we need to ensure is that police officers are careful about how they phrase their questions when they interview eyewitnesses. And research into eyewitness testimony is an area psychologists believe they can have a positive impact on people and society. So for example, they can improve the way the legal system works. If we know the effects of these leading questions questions, we can ensure that people who work in the systems know how to phrase them so that it doesn't bring up inaccurate evidence. A limitation is that the tasks are artificial. So if you think of the Loftus and Palmer study, they showed their participants film clips of car accidents, and that's artificial because they weren't real. And that's very different to experiencing a real accident, because if you experience a real accident, there is a lot more emotional stress experienced, whereas with watching clips, that's not experienced so much. And we do have evidence that emotion can have an effect on eyewitness testimony, for example, anxiety. And that was studied by Johnson and Scott, and they found that to have a negative impact on eyewitness testimony. And Yule and Kutzel, we found it to have a positive effect. So studies like Loftus and Palmer may in fact tell us very little about how leading questions affect eyewitness testimony in cases of real accidents, because they weren't studying a real accident. They were showing artificial car accident film clips. But it could be that we're being too pessimistic about the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So it might be more reliable than the studies that we've got suggest. A further limitation is individual differences. So generally, when we are studying a crime scene, we normally look towards younger people to give accurate accounts of eyewitness testimony, as evidence suggests that older people are worse with eyewitness testimony than younger people are. So we do have evidence of this. So Anastasi and Rhodes from 2006 found that people aged between 18 and 25 and 35 to 45 were much more accurate in terms of eyewitness testimony 
than people aged between 55 and 78 years. But all age groups were more accurate when they had to identify people of their own age. So this is own age bias. They find it easier to recall things if it's their own age. And research usually uses younger people to identify uh, things from a crime scene. And this may mean other age groups appear less accurate. But in fact, they aren't when identifying people of their own age, according to the study by Anastasi and Rhodes. So therefore, it might be that older people are better in terms of recalling things from a crime scene when they've got people of their own age. And that should be taken into account. But generally, we use younger people. Further limitation is demand characteristics. So Zagorosa and McCloskey in 1989 argued that many answers in lab studies are the result of demand characteristics. So if you remember that term, that's participants where they change their behaviour within the research study to fit what they believe the aim of the study is. Now, participants do not want to let the researcher down usually, and they want to appear helpful to the researcher. So what they may do is guess an answer just to be helpful, even if they're not sure. So participants may try and work out what is expected of them by using cues in the procedure, because if you're being shown film clips and being asked to estimate the speed, they may well work out what the experimenter is trying to gather information on and try and be helpful. So participants may not behave naturally, which is what we want them to do. We want them to be behaving naturally. And if they conclude that a certain response is wanted from them, so they might not behave the way they should be in terms of them behaving naturally. So this decreases the validity of the research studies as they're no longer measuring the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, but the participants ability to second guess the hypothesis. And this is exactly what we don't want in studies. A further limitation is consequences of eyewitness testimony. So Foster et al in 1994 points out that what you remember as an eyewitness can have important consequences in the real world. But this is not true in research studies. So if you think of the setup of a research study, it's not real. So the participants know that no matter the answers they give, it will not have any significant effects on people. So there's no serious consequences in eyewitness testimony research studies. So perhaps leading questions therefore have less effect on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony when the consequences are more serious because participants know that their responses really do matter in that instance. So therefore lab studies of eyewitness testimony may underestimate its accuracy. OK, so I've had a look through the past papers. I've found this one from the specimen second set on an A-level paper one. So this is for 16 marks. A woman is being questioned by a police officer after a heated argument she witnessed on an evening out with friends. The argument took place in a bar and ended with a violent assault. A knife was discovered later by police in the car park of the bar. Did you see the knife the attacker was holding? asked the police officer. I'm not sure there was a knife. Yes, there probably was, replied the woman. I was so scared at the time that it's hard to remember and my friends and I have talked about what happened so many times since that I'm almost not sure what I did say. Discuss research into two or more factors that affect the reliability of eyewitness testimony. Refer to the information above in your answer. So what I'm hoping you can see here is that you can refer to both leading questions and post event discussion. You can pick things out from this item, but also that you can talk about anxiety because that is still factors affecting eyewitness testimony. Look at the question there. It says discuss research, research as well. You need to bring in research to two or more factors that affect the reliability of eyewitness testimony. So the reliability of eyewitness testimony factors, you can bring in two spreads here. So your misleading information spread and your anxiety spread. So here's your different levels. Now, the marks for this question are different. So it is a 16 marker, but what it wants is six AO1 marks 
for AO2 marks, so you've got to be linking to the item, picking out information and supporting it with your knowledge. And then AA3 is six marks. So it's not as much evaluation here when you get an application question in a 16 mark. So have a look through those different descriptions, determine what you need to do differently between three and four, because a lot of students end up going down into level three just by making a few errors, which prevents them getting into that top level. OK, so here, look, there are occasional inaccuracies and application to the STEM is appropriate, although links to the factors are not always well explained. Whereas if you look at level four, application to the STEM is appropriate and links between factors and STEM content are explained. So you've just got to make sure that your answers follow through the points make sense you're clear and you're concise and coherent and you've always got to focus focus on what that question wants from you plan as well this question gave you a box to plan it wants students to think carefully about what it is that you're going to talk about what it is that you're going to link to each of these different factors so here's your AO1 content. It gives you the different things here that you can talk about. As you can see, anxiety is on there. We have not covered that in this video. But what I find interesting is that it talks about research that isn't actually in your textbook. So I would recommend having a look at what these different studies are and jotting a few down trying to remember them. If we look at the misleading information, we've got that did you see any broken glass? So that's the second part to Loftus and Palmer, which is very important to bring in if you want to talk about that, you don't have to because there is other research, but that is something that I find quite nicely follows on from their original study. So as you can see also, this is just a little bit more of the mark scheme. It's bringing in post event discussion there, which you can talk about. We have our Gabbert and colleagues study and then your AO2 application points. So here it shows you how you can link the item to leading questions, to anxiety and to post event discussion. And if we have a look at your AO3 marks, now this question, remember, it said discuss research. And then the question followed. Now that word discuss, outline and evaluate, it also wants you to discuss research. So your AO3 marks can come from evaluating your AO1. OK, so you evaluate the research. So this is why it gives examples here of things like methodological issues, including sampling, replication and cooperation with other studies, ethical issues, practical applications, issues of validity. We've been talking about that. Also, things like the tasks are artificial. So do be mentioning that it always says credit other relevant evaluation points Just make sure your answers are relevant. OK, another one is a level paper one from June 2017. So this was a 16 marker outline and evaluate research. So theories and or studies into the effects of misleading information on eyewitness testimony. So this is specifically looking at misleading information on eyewitness testimony. It doesn't want you to bring in anything to do with anxiety. OK, and it's saying theories and or studies. So it's actually giving you a little pointer there as to what it means by the research aspect. So do be talking about studies and the theories. And also you can plan. It's not essential. But you I would advise to always do so. There's your different bands. Have a look at those, the different levels. So it's six marks for AO1 and 10 marks for AO3 at A level. Just remember the split. So you've got your AO1 content and your AO3 content. It is basically the stuff that we have just been talking about. As you can see in the AO1, you've got the Loftus and Palmer. Another study that I haven't mentioned in this video is Loftus and Zani, 1975 of Did You See the A Broken Headlight? That is another one that you can bring in. You've got that response bias, explanation and substitution bias, which is what we looked at. Post event discussion, you've got Gabba and memory conformity, which we mentioned. And your evaluation is everything that we've just been talking through. OK, thank you for listening and best of luck with the rest of your revision.